Hello, welcome to Pride of South London Fan TV. Ali here, taking a look back at the Chelsea game and also looking ahead to tomorrow's game against Aston Villa. So the Chelsea game obviously couldn't have got off to a worse start with Gary Cahill's injury and the subsequent goal that it led to. Um, but it did definitely show more heart and desire from the players and definitely an improvement in terms of the performance. So lots more to be positive about, but no points to move us up that table. Um, it was sort of, you know, after the goal, we were still kind of in the game, but then I think that we were in a little bit of shock as to what happened with Cahill. And then the second goal looked like to it had killed the game, really. Um, some people questioning Joel Ward's positioning on the second goal. Personally, I think he did the right things in terms of... Um, of the way he stood up and, and moved Pulisic sort of further away from the goal, but it was just an outstanding finish um, from Pulisic. And, and there was nothing really we could do on that one. I, I think Vincenzo would have had to have pulled out an amazing save to have stopped that one. So a great goal from Chelsea on the second one. Um, and then, you know, you're, you're sitting there and you're thinking, here we go again after the recent performances. And then just from nowhere, a thunderbolt comes from Wilfred Saha. And, and the only uh, comparison I can make to it really is, is like if, after our last few dire performances, it, it's been like it, that Saha goal coming from nowhere is like sitting through a Peter Andre concert. Terrible tune after terrible tune. And then suddenly a banger comes along, a mysterious girl. Well, Wilfred Saha's banger came along and, and suddenly we were back in the game uh, and the goal definitely made me stop and stare and then I tried to concentrate on the rest of the game but my mind just wanted to explore the replays of that goal. Um, when Wilf plays like that he is our heart desire and he definitely sets our soul on fire um, but in all seriousness um, it was good to have Saha back to more of him at his old self. Um, it is interesting isn't it? Um, I definitely think there's something in this in that he for me, this season, his best performances have come on the whole against some of the bigger teams. And I think, for me, <laughs> there'll be sceptics out there saying he's playing for a move to, to some of these bigger teams. But for me, um, it's because these bigger teams don't really use that tactic of two or three men marking him, physically assaulting him routinely through the game. They've got more faith in their own game and their own ability to bring the game to us. And um, that, that gives Wolf a little bit more space. Um, and for me, you get, I mean, particularly having been at the Emirates this season, um, where he got a lot of space, um, I think against the bigger teams, he, he, he actually, ironically, gets more space to, to do his thing and he looks more comfortable. Um, and it was, a, it was a good performance from Wolf. I, I wouldn't say it was one of his top performances. Of the, of the, the goal maybe makes it one of his top performances of the season, but it was good to see his, his spark back um, and him being the player that we know he can be. So 2-1, you're thinking, right, we're back in this game. And for me, we were dominating the midfield. Um, Gilmore was being bullied by, by our central midfield. Kiate was bossing it in there. Uh, James McArthur as well, playing very well. Um, but really, for me, that's why I almost see this as a bit of a lost opportunity um, because we were dominating that central midfield and then the third goal came along and it was a bit out the, the first two goals I didn't really feel we could do anything about third goal I think was a soft goal to concede Patrick Van Arnholt jogging back is not a good good image um, so disappointing um, some people as well are there saying Joel Wood and Joel Wood was a little bit more to blame on that one because he was playing them on uh, Abraham on in an onside position so disappointing goal to concede on the on the third, but then suddenly we're back in it like a minute later. And who scores? Christian Benteke. Um, and, and that's a shame, really, that the fans weren't there to share that moment with him. His first goal in a while at Sellers Park. Uh, it's good to see him sort of starting to boss defenders around again. And, and we're seeing more of the old Christian Benteke. And we, we felt, didn't we, like he was getting himself back into form just before lockdown. And all he needed was, a, oh, we're saying that for a long time now, all he needed was a goal, but he did get that goal. And hopefully we'll see him score some more tomorrow at Villa Park at, on his old, stump, on his old stump, uh, stamping ground. So, uh, moving on. It's 3-2. Uh, at this point, um, you're thinking, we can get back in this game. As I said, we've dominated the central midfield. And after the goal, you felt like we could develop some momentum. But the momentum stopped. 
and the game. We allowed the game to fizzle out. And, and I've got to come to this. Um, for me, again, rearing its head is Roy's in-game management. Um, he did not bring on Andrus Townsend until the 80th minute. And then he did his usual substitution of James McCarthy for James McCarthy again. Defensive midfielder for defensive midfielder. Now, I've got two issues here again. One is why did he leave it to the 80th minute? You know, we're back in it 3-2 with around 20 minutes to go. And then you look at what happens on the opposite dugout. Now, I know Chelsea have a lot more options on their bench than we do. But Jorginho coming on, obviously then for them, it sort of changed their, their impetus. I mean, there was a stat that they then had 80% of possession. Now, obviously, we don't have a Jorginho on the bench, but we do have a couple of options. Why not use those options? And for me, those are options who, who could potentially change a game for us or, or change our style. And they are, those two players are Andros Townsend and Max Meyer. Um, Max Meyer didn't get used till the 89th minute. Um, at least he came on in a central position this time. I'm not sure what Luca's got to do to be taken off. For me, he was very poor again. His passing leaves a lot to be desired at the moment. Um, but Townsend on in the 80th minute, I see it's too late. And by that point, the game was fizzling out. And my other issue is, why take Jordan Nayu off? Why not have Andros Townsend, Wilfred Saha, Jordan Nayu, and Benteke on the pitch? We're losing the game. What are we protecting? A four games in a row defeat? <laughs> four games in a row losing defeat streak? Oh, is that what we're protecting? I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of lost for words here, as you can see by Roy's in-game management. Um, Jordan Nye is our top goal scorer. We need a goal, so we take our top goal scorer off. Now, I would agree that Jordan Nye didn't have his best game. He was playing too deep. Why not put him up front with Benteke? Have Wilf and Townsend on the wings. Have two central midfielders. We've got 10 minutes to go. We need a goal. As I said, what, 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 what were we protecting? Are we protecting our four defeats in a row? Um, it is very frustrating. And um, Palace fans are growing in frustration at Roy's in-game management. So, obviously, there's just so much good about Roy. But this element of his management has frustrated for a while now, I think. And, and it is getting more and more pertinent. Um, so, interestingly, I ran a poll uh, this week to see where fans were at with this. And um, I gave three options. Now, the first option was Steven Gerrard with in the sort of Morales combination. So if we got Gerrard, would we be able to then to attract Morales? My second option was the one that a lot of Palace fans are talking about, Sean Dyche and that Dwight McNeil combination. And then my third option, which is one that I actually think we really need to explore, because as I said, there have been so many positives of Royce management through his career and his time at Palace. And um, this option is an interesting one for me, is what about Roy alongside a younger, innovative coach? Now, someone to challenge him on his in-game management on the touchline. But the results of the poll didn't go in Roy's favour. The actual winner was Steven Gerrard with 48.6% of the vote. Coming in second, Sean Dyche with 31.4%. And Roy, alongside an innovative, an innovative assistant, got 20% of the vote. So that sort of tells you where a lot of Palace fans' heads are right now. For me personally... Um, I think I would lean towards the Roy option still with an innovative coach. Who is that coach? Maybe you could uh, make some suggestions of a young innovative assistant who could come in, maybe bring some new ideas to the table, particularly in how we can change a game during a game. Um, leave, it, leave some suggestions in the comments below. Who could be that coach alongside Roy to sort of change things up a little bit? Um, but, you know, short, the, where I'm also at, though, is... A lot of people think Sean Dyche would be a good fit. Is it sort of, you know, if we leave it another year, and we know Roy's not going to go on forever. If we say we left it another year, then Roy decides he's going to retire a year after. And then, and then in the summer, Sean Dyche, who is, we're led to believe isn't exactly happy at Burnley. You don't know what to believe in, but there's a lot of rumours swirling around. If he, if he goes to another club this summer, will we see it as a, a missed opportunity. We've been there before where we've had limited man managerial options, for example, when we ended up just having to go with Warnock almost as an interim. Should we strike now while someone who we think could be a good fit for Palace is available? Um, so it is a difficult one. 
as I said, my head is at Roy and a, and maybe an innovative assistant coming along alongside him. Um, I'm not sure who that assistant is though. So like I said, if you could think of someone who could come in as a as a new as a as an assistant, I'm not saying get rid of Ray Lewinson, by the way, he's a great coach, but just someone else to just bring new ideas to the table on that touchline. Who, who could that be? Uh, make some suggestions in the comments below. So uh, let, let's move on to the Villa game. Um, it's a must-win game for me. We have to win this one. Um, people saying, should we lose so that we <laughs> increase the chances of West Ham or Watford being relegated or even Brighton still? But Brighton could actually overtake us. They're only six points behind us. So a win for them this weekend and a defeat for us would leave us in a very fragile position in terms of our superiority over Brighton in the table. And I don't think any of us want to jeopardise that. And also the two seasons, so the after the re this restart finishes, but the alleged start for next season is meant to be, I think, early September. So it's not going to be much time in between the two seasons. And what we don't want is, if we don't beat Aston Villa, we've then got Wolves, Man we've got Man United first, then Wolves and Tottenham. Not easy games. <laughs> You're looking at, you know, potentially going, we could look at a potential seven or eight game without a win run. Do we want that overhanging us into the next season? So we've got to use this Villa game as an opportunity. No disrespect, but I think Villa are a poor team. Um, they probably bring quite big comparisons to us in terms of that they are seen as a one-man team in, with Jack Grealish and in a similar way with with us and Wilfred Saha. But it, our, the league positions don't lie. We are superior, I think, in terms of quality overall. And we need to go into this game with a positive mindset. Um, and I, that will lead me to my team selection. Um, I am going to obviously stick with Vincente in goal. Joel Ward at right back. I think Sacco and Dan ended the game well together, so I'll stick with that combination. Cahill obviously out. I know Kelly is returning, but I don't think Roy's going to throw him straight in. Left back, let's give Tyrick Mitchell a chance. He hasn't had a chance since restart, despite Roy saying that he would be using the youngsters. If we don't put him in this game... Where are we going to give him his debut? I know he came on for a few minutes, but his full debut, we're not going to do I wouldn't do it against Man United, the form they're in, or away at Wolves. So let's put him in against Villa, who, as I've said, beyond Grealish, I think are quite a poor side, uh, probably going to get relegated. And we could actually be the team who pushed them towards that drop on, on Sunday. Um, Put Tyrick Mitchell in at left back. Give the young, exciting fullback a chance. I would then put PVA further forward. And a lot of fans have been talking about this on social media. Could we put PVA further forward? Could he play that role? Well, Gareth Bale started his career as a fullback. We know that PVA going forward is probably his biggest attribute. Let, let's try that out. Um, and also, that would be quite good um, in terms of Tyrick making his debut. Um, Tyrick Mitchell making his debut is that um, you having PVA just in front of him would offer him that sort of protection and PVA could sort of talk him through the game. I think it would be a really, really good option for us on that left-hand side. Um, central midfield, I'm going to change up as well. Um, I would like Luca dropped. His performances, apart from the Bournemouth game, have been really poor. He hasn't had the best season. His passing is leaving a lot to be decided, as I said earlier in this video. He's often giving the ball away. I don't know what he needs to do to be, to, to be dropped. And I even think he might be suspended anyway, to be honest. But he should, even if he wasn't suspended, he should be dropped. So uh, let's bring in Yiro, uh, Gyro Riddleworld. Um, and for me, he could do a man-marking job on Grealish. Uh, the way that Grealish moves from the middle, he drifts out wide, I think would suit uh, Gyro. He could... Um, Almost, you know, when Grealish almost becomes a winger on the right or the left when he drifts out wide, then uh, Gyro really well will be almost in a full, forced into a fullback role, but we know he can do that role. And I think as well, um, uh, Gyro's ball retention is much better than Lucas. So let's bring him in alongside James MacArthur. Why do we have to play with three defensive midfielders? I get it to be against bigger teams, but not against the team who are in the relegation zone. So I would like us to try something new in this game. And why? And this is my, I would, it's, it's a positional change, but he's done these positional changes before. I would put Andros Townsend as a central attacking midfielder. 
I just feel like we need someone in that middle to drive us forward. And Andros, with his dribbling, could be the man to do that. Um, and the other thing with Andros is he's very good, obviously, at long shots. Now, if he's in a more central role, arriving in the box late, thinking about players who've done that through their careers, like Frank Lampard. I'm not comparing Andros Townsend to Frank Lampard here. But I think it would maybe possibly um, give him more options in terms of his shooting if we played him in a central role. So what have we really got to lose at the moment? We need to try something new. We need to mix it up. We need to get ourselves out of this rut. So I'm going to go and with a central midfield of Jairo Riddleworld, um, James McArthur, and Andros Townsend in attacking midfield uh, central role, with Wilf on the right to that and PVA on the left. Now, the other positive of putting Andros Townsend as an attacking central midfielder is it could be quite fluid with him and Wilf, with them swapping over, because we know like Wilf, we know Wilf likes to come inside as well. So that would be my midfield up front. The goal machine, that is Christian Benteke, against his old team, which hopefully will inspire him to more goals. And then that leaves us a very good option on the bench in Jordan Ayew. I think that's a good team. If you disagree with it, as always, leave some comments in the comments section below. What team would you play tomorrow? Uh, my prediction, I think we're going to win this 1-3-1. Like I said, there were signs um, that we were showing more positive signs against Chelsea. I just think Villa, they have to win this game. Um, to at very least, they need to try and force the last game shootout against West Ham. They need to be within two points. Like a draw is not going to be enough for them. That means at some point they're going to have to come at us. Um, I'm not really fearing them. Samata up front is quite poor. Grealish is really the only worry. El Ghazi can sometimes be a threat, but there's nothing too frightening. I think the fact they've got to come at us, they will have to come at us at some point, like I said, because they know they need a win. They need those three points. Really lends itself to us to our strength, which is our counter-attacking play. And I think whilst Villa will be looking at our form, thinking they've got a chance, they will know their management. They will be fearing our counter-attacking play. And I think with Wilf, Andros, Jordan Ayew on the break, even though I haven't put Jordan Ayew in my 11, I think at some point he'll play a role. And PVA, we know, is very good at bombing forward. I think and Benteke's upsurge in form, I think that we will catch them on the break. So I'm going to go for Aston Villa 1, Crystal Palace 3. Let's hope I am correct and that comes Sunday evening, we are feeling glad all over. As always, if you disagree with anything I say, please leave comments in the comment section below. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe.